Hi, welcome back to Videos from the Ville. I'm Charlie Greenewalt, and Professor Greenewalt, and this is Introduction to City Planning. Uh, on this particular um, presentation, we're going to look at Ian McCard's uh, textbook uh, called Design with Nature. We want to look at this um, quite um, landmark uh, publication that dates back to 1969. Uh, and while we do so, again, I recommend that you have your PowerPoints with you and uh, you can follow along with those uh, PowerPoints. Uh, the timing of this publication in 1969 uh, was uh, very good. Um, good timing for Ian McCarg and good time for environmental planning because what happened was this textbook dealt with several serious deficiencies in the planning practice at that time. Number one, uh, we didn't really have a lot of knowledge. There was an absence of knowledge of the environment in the planning process. Uh, as the planning process was conducted up until 1969, uh, the environment really didn't uh, play a large role in that process. Number two, uh, planning wasn't integrated. It wasn't integrated with the environmental sciences. It wasn't integrated with the study of geology, hydrology, meteorology, or soil science. And all those things should be considered and taken a look at in the planning process. We find that um, also as of 1969, there were no theories that were available, no theories were present that tried to address the problems of human, adapt human adaptation to the environment. So there were no theories that were uh, present that uh, tried to address the problems of human adaptation uh, to the environment. We find that uh, traditionally there is just a very, very small number, a small collection of studies that dealt with the relationship of man to his environment, looking at the whole ball of wax. McCarg, um, essentially as he goes through his professional p pathway and develops, uh, became known as an environmental planner. He really is a pioneer in this area and uh, the individual who's most responsible uh, for environmental planning and um, promoting it, molding it, and having it uh, uh, be adopted in a, um, almost a universal um, basis throughout the world. We find that what was McCarg's background? Well, McCarg was born in Scotland, specifically in Glasgow, and raised in Glasgow. We found that um, at the time when he was born and raised, um, most uh, homes were uh, heated through coal. And uh, when uh, one would go out in the morning, one would look across the uh, horizon and just see a black smoke rising from all the homes in Glasgow. And one would have to, uh, you find him a car, as a young man, as a young boy, and man had to take hikes and loved to take hikes just outside the city so he could escape uh, the blackness uh, that had been produced by this uh, type of heating. And of course, the soot got on uh, the roofs, the soot got on uh, the buildings and the streets, and uh, there was ash everywhere. Uh, and it wasn't a, um, a cheerful or welcoming environment, uh, as he saw when he went into the countryside. We find that uh, Ian McCarg has been honored um, in the past at many different conferences. There are uh, two um, links that uh, you can press there uh, and you will see uh, his um, speech when he was honored at the ESRI uh, user uh, conference several years ago and his speech is quite wonderful 
you'll see um, how the Scots uh, value uh, words and language. Uh, you'll also uh, see his love of poetry and how most Scots will be able to uh, recite uh, several major poems uh, at the uh, drop of a hat. Uh, and uh, he uses that very adeptly, those tools very adeptly, uh, as he addresses his audience. I'm not going to, if we were in a traditional face-to-face -face class, I would press on the links and I'd bring those presentations up for you to watch and we'd discuss them. Here I'm going to require, I'm going to uh, uh, let you press on those links yourself and go and see how McCarg does this. What you'll also notice about McCarg, uh, this speech um, at this conference, the prize was uh, delivered late in life. You'll notice from him clearing his throat uh, frequently that the man has emphysema and he would die several years later. Uh, I don't think it can, who knows, it may have come from breathing all the uh, dust from the uh, coal heating uh, as a child, but uh, I think it had much more to do with he was a heavy, heavy smoker uh, throughout his lifetime. Well, as we go through McCarg, um, what are we going to see? What McCarg is introducing through the um, title of environmental planning is simply common sense. He's introducing common sense uh, to planning. He's saying that one, uh, as one looks for places to develop or places to build, where should that be? Uh, should you build on the, um, on the side of a volcano? Probably not a good idea. Uh, Harry Truman was a man who built a home on the side of uh, Mount St. Helens uh, just before it exploded. Well, he lived there for decades. It was an um, ancestral home, and uh, he thought that uh, he would always be able to live there. But when Mount St. Helens exploded some years ago, uh, he went with it. Um, you don't want to build on a floodplain, particularly a floodplain that uh, is a, um, a smaller number, uh, five year, 10 year, 20 year, 25 year uh, floodplain, because you know that every five years, 10 years, or 20 years, you're going to lose your home or have to recover it again. Um, you don't want to build as my brother has. My brother owns uh, a home uh, with his family uh, in Sacramento, California, right on the San Andreas Fault. You shouldn't build uh, homes on uh, earthquake fault lines. Uh, you uh, don't want to, as well, build homes right on the edge of the beach. If how many of you uh, have been to uh, the Outer Banks? If you've been to the Outer Banks, one of the places that you probably visit was where the Wright brothers made their first flight at Kill Devil Hills. And right beside the Kill Devil Hills, and probably, if my memory serves me, on Kill Devil Hills, and right next door on Duck, in Duck, North Carolina, there are many, there are numerous homes that are built on the seashore. They're not built over the first dune and the second dune. They're built right on the ocean uh, shore. Those homes will not be there in a number of years. I don't know how many years, uh, but it won't take uh, long. Eventually, any home that's built on the seashore uh, without the protection of uh, one or two dunes uh, will be swept away. And uh, it's something that um, you find that the federal government's actually encouraged, because for years there was a federal insurance that would allow um, owners of homes at the seashore to um, recover a certain amount of money. I don't remember what the levels were anymore. Uh, if your home was swept away, and um, I don't know, uh, I haven't checked recently to see if that uh, number was altered uh, or if the insurance is still there. I believe, unfortunately, it may be, which serves as an incentive for people to build right on the seashore. Um, well, this is what um, the whole uh, notion of environmental planning is all about. Um, 
trying to find the very best place to put your development where it makes sense, um, where you're going to interfere with the fewest pr natural processes of, uh, where you're going to interfere with the fewest uh, processes of nature. Uh, that's what you want to do. Well, let's look for a moment at seashore development. Let's look for a moment at seashore development. Some of you might be familiar with that uh, section of Delaware. With that section of Delaware between Ocean City, Maryland, and Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. I um, believe it's, uh, uh, is it US 3 or US 1? Uh, the major highway that runs directly from uh, Rehoboth Beach to Dewey Beach to um, down to Bethany Beach to Indian River uh, down to Ocean City, uh, Maryland. Um, that is one of the best examples when uh, best examples of a place to consider as we look at the phenomena of seashore development. And one of the reasons for that being that most of you I've found in the past, that living here in South Central Pennsylvania, many of you and your families have traditionally gone to the shore in the summertime. And many of you have gone to either Rehoboth Beach um, or to uh, Ocean City, Maryland. So you're familiar with this area. When I talk about it, you can uh, relate to it and understand it. Well, let's take a look at um, development. Uh, at the sea, uh, at the seashore. Uh, how do we deal with it? How do we, uh, how do we manage it? We have to look first at uh, what provides um, any type of development at the seashore from a defense uh, against the sea. And of course, it is nothing more than our sand dunes. So our sand dunes are very important uh, to uh, have as protection and to protect them, to preserve them. You find that what is very important to hold these sand dunes into place, well, what's important, what's vital are grasses, the different types of uh, grass that you find along the shoreline. Uh, we find that uh, we have different marum grasses and we have sedge grasses. Marum grasses and sedge grasses which are both uh, pictured in your uh, PowerPoint slides that uh, accompany this presentation. So grasses are very important. So what we should not do when we go to the seashore is we should not be walking over um, the primary or secondary dunes. Uh, we want to look for uh, walkways over those dunes so we don't trample on the grass. If you trample on the grass, what happens time and again, it simply kills it. You find that grass. You find that grasses indeed are very vulnerable to tramping, trampling, uh, and they can be killed. They can be uh, harmed, injured, uh, but they can die if too many people walk on them. We find the grasses uh, may be uh, able to tolerate a high degree of salinity, uh, a lot of salt. They may be able to tolerate harsh uh, the glare of the sun, harsh solar glare. They may be able to tolerate a uncertain uh, supply of water. And they may be able to tolerate soil that doesn't have a lot of humus in it um, to uh, nourish it. Uh, but you find that they, uh, they may be able to tolerate these things, but they are, do not deal well at all with trampling. 
You find that grasses, uh, these two different types of grasses, will thrive on sand dunes. And generally what they do is they produce this extensive, dense mat of roots that keep the dune in place. They anchor the sand uh, so they, you have uh, a uh, natural barrier to deal with the force of the winds and the force of the ocean. Well, one of the best places to look uh, at as we consider uh, the dunes and the sea development uh, is the Netherlands and Holland. You find that uh, no one perhaps in the world is better than the Dutch at uh, protecting, uh, protecting their land. And they have for centuries uh, built uh, dikes, of course, uh, to protect their land where they weren't enough dunes or if they wanted to go out into the ocean and reclaim some of that land uh, for themselves and reclaim, reclaim that land from the ocean. So they built dikes for generations, for centuries, as artificial dunes, if you will. Uh, you find that in the northern part of Holland, there are three different lines of dikes that are built uh, if there's going to be land that's reclaimed from the sea. And they replicate what uh, the sand dunes would actually do. And the, th the three lines of dikes, uh, the first dike is called uh, the guardian. It guards from the severest of um, water and wind uh, assaults on the land. The second um, uh, dike is called uh, the sleeper. It's there to um, pick up the um, work of the guardian if the guardian is broken or is overcome by wind and surf. And after the guardian and the sleeper, the third dune, the third line of defense for the Dutch is the dreamer, the dreamer. So these are the three lines of dikes uh, that the Dutch build to reclaim land from the sea and protect uh, land uh, and development from the sea. The guardian, the sleeper, and the dreamer. And I have pictures in here uh, for you of some of the um, dikes and that you find uh, in Holland and some of the other uh, areas alongside the ocean. Um, I hope uh, that many of you have had a chance to go to Holland. When you go to Holland, one of the most interesting things is the incredible flatness of the, um, the country. Uh, it's one of the countries that's most conducive to bicycle transportation because there are no hills, essentially. You can go everywhere in Holland on uh, flat territory and everyone owns a bike. Uh, you find that the Dutch learned their lessons over many, many centuries. And the Dutch simply learned that the sea cannot uh, ultimately be stopped. The sea can only be directed. The tr sea can be tempered, um, but it can't be stopped. Um, so what they did is they emphasized something that we call flexible dike construction. Um, you find that in modern times many places in the modern world uh, there are people that attempt to make dikes or uh, to reinforce sand dunes with uh, concrete, with reinforced concrete. Uh, that is not the right way to um, guard against the sea. You want to, as the Dutch do, have a flexible dike construction. The dikes uh, that the Dutch use are made of bundles of twigs bundles of twigs, um, and they're laid out in courses of sand and of clay. Uh, and then what we do is then, when they have all these, um, these uh, twigs that are put into packages and are sort of set into a, a framework of clay and of sand, then they may be uh, encased with uh, some form of masonry, uh, but we find that uh, concrete structures 
uh, what they end up doing is absorbing the entire force of the sea wave uh, and eventually uh, the sea will cut under uh, any concrete walls and uh, over time will eventually weaken it and, and break it. You find that uh, dunes, on the other hand, dunes, uh, natural dunes absorb the full uh, force, the uh, full weight of uh, the waves uh, and the wind, and they reduce the velocity of the waves and of the wind as well. Um, we find that this information is known very well in Holland. It's taught on a widespread basis, but it seems to be known very little in America. Uh, after uh, the uh, Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana some years ago, we find that um, New Orleans was devastated, and there was a delegation that came from the Netherlands, that came from Holland, uh, to offer their assistance to the folks in Louisiana. And uh, I don't know what happened, if they had their signals crossed, if the wrong people were just assigned to this situation, but um, the Dutch officials were um, greeted by some very nice people from Louisiana. They took them to one of the best um, restaurants in New Orleans. Of course, there were a handful that were left. may have been that they uh, uh, went to Antoine's, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, they went to the restaurant. Um, the Dutch offered their assistance in uh, rebuilding the dikes up and down the length of the Mississippi, and they offered some ideas on how the, that dike system could be strengthened and improved. Um, and the folks from Louisiana so really thanked them profusely, and uh, they um, shook their hands, they uh, patted them on the back, and they took them to the airport and put them back on the planes and said goodbye. They um, didn't take their advice seriously, uh, and uh, they didn't uh, really try to put into practice the information that the Dutch were trying to share with them. Well, we find that there are some natural processes at work in the sea uh, that we should know about. One is littoral drift. Littoral drift, that's spelled L-I-T-T-O-R-A-L, -T -T I believe. Littoral, L-I-T-T-O-R-A-L. Littoral drift is simply the erosion of the north side uh, of a um, of an of a island or any kind of land formation that sticks out in the ocean. Now here we're talking about the eastern shore of North America. In the North Atlantic, uh, at least um, in the uh, North Atlantic in North America, uh, the sea will come at an angle and strike the land at an angle. So if, um, oh, say if this is the shoreline of uh, North America, this is New Jersey, uh, the ocean uh, will strike uh, the shoreline of New Jersey this way. We'll strike it at an angle. And uh, what it does is it strips land from the northern part of an island and sends it to the southern part of an island. Uh, you can see this when you go to, for example, Chincoteague. Just south of Ocean City, Maryland, is Chincoteague, Virginia, where the wild ponies are. Uh, maybe you've seen the movie Misty, uh, movie uh, for children. Uh, that was made by Warner Brothers back in the uh, well, early 60s, I believe. But when you go to Chincoteague, you'll see on Assateague uh, Island, um, it's a national uh, park, but you'll see... Um, a lighthouse, and the lighthouse is about, oh, almost a mile, uh, maybe not quite, but it seems almost maybe th somewhere between half and three quarters of a mile from the southern tip of the island. The point of the matter is, is when that uh, lighthouse was built in the 19th century, it was built on the tip, the southern tip of the island, but over the years, 
uh, littoral drift has stripped sand from the northern reaches of Assateek Island and shifted that sand to the southern end of the island and the southern end has grown and as the southern end has grown so then the uh, lighthouse is no longer at the southern tip of Assateek Island. It's a great example of littoral drift. I believe if my memory is correct that Barnegat Light in New Jersey is another example. I believe Barnegat Light may be at the northern end of the northern tip uh, of some of these uh, islands along the uh, shoreline and what happened there when Barnegat Light was built in the 19th century um, the builders of that simply took huge massive boulders and they put them on the northern side of the light so that littoral drift uh, wouldn't be at work um, and wouldn't um, strip away all the land ar from around the uh, lighthouse that the lighthouse would have a beachhead and would always be at the northern end of the, uh, of the island, if my memory is uh, correct. Um, you find that uh, the other thing that we need to talk about in natural processes here is not only littoral drift, but we need to bear in mind always what are the hindrances to plant growth when we look at the shore? What are the hindrances for plant growth? Well, number one, it's salinity that we've talked about before. Um, some overwhelming amount of salt uh, can uh, uh, be uh, very difficult for plants to deal with. And number two is uh, water supply. Water supply. Um, the plants do need to have sufficient water even though you're at the beach. Uh, it doesn't mean that it necessarily is raining all the time. So things that are uh, hindrances for the growth of plant life uh, which helps anchor the dunes again is salinity and secondly water supply. Uh, as we look at the seashore and we talk about seashore development we have to be aware of the fact that there are zones there are zones of development for the seashore. There are essentially, um, essentially six different zones that we have to be aware of and what they can be used for and what they can't be used for. Uh, we can start on the ocean side and we can work our way to the, um, uh, to the beach. I'm sorry, we can start at the, the beach or the ocean side and work our way to the bay, if you'd like. Um, Okay, when we look at the seashore zones, and if you look in your textbook, look in your textbook um, in McCarg, Design with Nature, and you'll see a very nice illustration of all the zones of the um, uh, seashore, uh, how they're defined, uh, how they function in nature, and how we can develop them and for what purposes. Let's take a look at these different, um, these different um, uh, zones. First, of course, is the beach. Um, the beach itself uh, can be used for intensive recreation. Um, the beach um, yeah, can be uh, walked upon and used heavily by um, uh, individuals. Um, it's, um, it's uh, however, we shouldn't have uh, buildings being located on the beach for the reasons that we talked about several minutes ago. Eventually, uh, any structures that are located on the very uh, front of the beach will be washed away and uh, destroyed by various storms. But first, we have the beach. Um, after the uh, ocean and the beach, uh, the next thing that we'll find is the primary dune. Uh, the primary dune must be protected. Uh, it is the most important defense for the land that lies behind it. Uh, so the primary dune shouldn't be walked upon uh, and there should be uh, walkways or bridges built over it to allow, um, uh, to allow beachgoers uh, to get to the shore. 
to get to the sand and be able to uh, uh, enjoy the ocean uh, just beyond the primary dune. But the primary dune should not be walked upon. Uh, you don't want to trample the grasses that hold the dune into place and it shouldn't be developed. Uh, it should be protected. Then we have a trough. After the ocean, the beach, um, the primary dune, then we have a trough between the primary dune and the secondary dune. In that trough, we find that you can have some very limited recreation and some very limited, some very light uh, development. Um, find that you would like to try to discourage that as much as possible and move that development back to the next area. But um, you can have uh, some limited amount. Now, what we find that when we're looking uh, at the troughs, uh, that the troughs um, uh, need to um, be careful of um, the amount of water that's available to them and they need to still protect the plant life that's there again to keep the sand into place uh, but uh, you find that the trough for example is you has been used in the past uh, by some people that developed homes, for example, at the shore, the trough would be used to uh, put uh, sewage in. Uh, the trough does not have the right kind of soil to absorb um, any sewage. No sewage at all should be pumped into the trough. That needs to be uh, put into storage tanks and to be pumped out uh, separately. So the trough can have a little bit uh, of... Um, recreation, a little bit of human activity, a little bit of development, but really you should have light development and uh, no sewage should ever be uh, put into this ground there and there's certainly, uh, you don't want to try to take out any water from there. So you have the ocean, the beach, um, the um, primary dune, you have the trough, then you have the secondary dune pretty much the same limitations that the primary dune had uh, also apply to the secondary dune, okay? So the secondary dune, again, you don't want to walk on it because you don't want to kill the plant life. You don't want to develop it. Um, again, we have to worry about developing the primary dune or developing the secondary dune. Uh, as soon as we develop them, uh, you... Um, if you uh, move the sand about, you can weaken the dune. And during a storm, uh, if you cut through the dune or you have development at any one part, uh, chances are as you uh, move this, the, the sand about that a strong storm will break through the dune there. And uh, then you, um, you have a uh, whole different type of land formation if a storm breaks through the, through the dune uh, and then forms another uh, water uh, inlet there. So you want to protect the secondary dune in the same manner you protect the um, primary dune. Protect the secondary dune that way. Um, then after we go from the beach, um, the ocean, the beach, uh, the primary uh, dune, the trough, the secondary dune, uh, then we have uh, the back, the black dune, the back dune. The back dune is the place where development should occur in the seashore. This is the place that you can build roads and actually strengthen the back dune if the road is built properly. Uh, this is a place where people can live. This is a place where you can have commercial uh, establishments. So the back dune. Um, Again, the back dune, you still have to be careful. You don't want to take um, much, if any, water at all from the back dune. You need to have seashore um, cities having water pumped in. You don't want to put sewage in the back dune, again, either. So again, the sewage needs to be stored and pumped out by different uh, commercial establishments and taken away. Um, I guess that's... Uh, that's about uh, all I have to say about the back dune, is this is where you will have development when you, uh, when you have it. 
uh, after the back dune, you finally have the bay shore and the back bay. And the bay shore and the back bay and the bay shore should be used pretty much the same way that the beach should be used. You can have some limited recreation there. You can have some limited uh, fishing and boating and fish uh, and uh, uh, canoeing and kayaking and so forth. Uh, but the bay um, is a little more fragile. It's well, it's much more fragile than the ocean is. The bay um, should not be uh, disturbed or dug up because the bay is a big sanctuary for all forms of aquatic life. This is where aquatic life regenerates itself. These where many, this is where many birds, many fish, many aquatic forms of life go to reproduce. This is where water is filtered. The uh, bay and the back dune area must be protected very carefully and we shouldn't be taking mud or water, um, I'm sorry, mud or ground out of the dune, out of the, out of the bay to be used elsewhere when we do try to pump sand back onto the beach to restore the beaches that's generally done uh, from the uh, ocean, it should never be done from the bay and when it's done from the ocean it has to be done uh, for many miles out uh, if it's not to be uh, a major disturbance for uh, that area. Um, ah, and then the question becomes uh, where development should not occur. Uh, that's on your, uh, on your uh, slides. And the one area that where development shouldn't occur based on what I talked about a moment ago is on the narrowest on the narrowest section of the sandbar because this is indeed where breaching can occur where the sand dune uh, I'm sorry the sandbar can be broken into two by storms so the narrowest section of the sandbar is one in which we want no development at all <coughs> okay well, as we were saying, we can have development on the back dune, and the back dune is where we should have highways being located. Indeed, that highway from Rehoboth Beach goes through Dewey Beach and Bethany Beach, I guess Fen uh, in Indian River, Fenwick Island, and then on to Ocean City. It all occurs along uh, the uh, back dune of that particular sandbar that extends uh, all the way from Rehoboth to Ocean City. Actually, highways, uh, you can look upon them in a uh, slightly different way. They can actually strengthen that third line of defense. A well-built highway could strengthen the uh, back dune. You find that when sand is used, uh, to replenish the beach, for example, or to help build some projects on the back dune. The sand always, 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 as I said a minute ago, has to come from the ocean, not the bay. But when you do dredge the bay, uh, you're going to be uh, essentially creating a desert because you're going to be removing all the things, all the elements that allow a bay uh, to regenerate itself and to restore life. Um, well, when we go to the next slide of um, seashore development and we talk about what are the major development problems um, at the uh, beach, uh, number one, they are water, that we don't have a large supply of water. When we get to Bethany Beach, you see an enormous water tank uh, there as one comes into town. And that's an example of the fact that all these towns realize they have to bring water in from the outside and they have to, if possible, capture the water that they, the uh, rainfall that they do have and use that uh, intelligently and they have to have large stores of water uh, to use for day-to-day -day life. Sewage is another problem. Uh, sand will not process um, the uh, sewage so we have to have the sewage uh, collected and uh, sent to a 
uh, sewage treatment plant and gotten rid of properly. Um, you find that uh, sewer and sewage treatment plants are very, very key and necessary in any and all uh, seashore developments. Um, the last thing I, s I have said here on your slide is the uh, silts of the bay shore. Uh, they are um, not suitable for usage as septic tanks. Again, we want to collect the sewage from all the, uh, all the homes along the beach and take them to a sewage uh, treatment plant for processing them. And I have a picture there of Bethany Beach for you to take a look at in your uh, slideshow. Let's take a break here and we'll come back in a moment and we'll go from seashore development and we'll move to uh, how we select the proper route for highways uh, to be built. How do we do highway route selection? <laughs> 